Hey everybody, thanks for coming by. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 309. Today, we have something really different for you. It's a guest, but we're here to talk about a specific topic. Specifically, I'm here with Mr. Gary Reinel, and we're going to talk about why icing injuries not only isn't helpful, but is actually hurting your recovery. I'm going to let him talk about all the science, all the background, all the information that you need, but a couple of housekeeping items before we get there. You can find the show notes for this or any other episode at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, as well as our full product line at whistlekick.com. So sit back, listen up, and be ready to have your entire recovery protocol changed. Hello, Mr. Rhino, Jeremy Lesniak. Hey, call me Gary. You make me feel old when you call me Okay, Mr. well, Ryan. well, now that you have have granted me that permission, you know this is this might be a little bit different from from other shows that you've done because you know it's a martial arts show, and, and so we we tr- we we always start with with respect, and and we'll you know kind of dial it back a little bit. So now that that you've said I can call you Gary, I will call you Gary. How are you? Good, Zachary. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. It's 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 hot as all get out here in Vermont right now. It's Day, I think we're day four, day five of ninety plus, which we don't usually do. Uh, you guys are hot then because you have the water, but our, our low for the past week has been eighty one, and we've been pushing up to one hundred and eight, hundred and nine. Wow, <laughs> you win. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, granted, it is entirely different. I was just on the East Coast uh, two weeks ago, and uh, the humidity there is completely different than we have here. Yeah, it is. It is out of control. Um, it, it's yeah. it's gross. We'll we'll have thunderstorms once in a while. We may have experienced this, and and it rains, and it rains really hard. And you think, oh, thank God, it will be cooler. And no, no, the temperature is the same after. It's just muggy. It's like <laughs> it's like the rain doesn't even hit the ground. It just steams off somewhere in between, and you feel like you're in a greenhouse. Well, the the the, the good news is. You have plants and flowers and trees and things like that that actually grow there. Right. We don't have any of those kind of things. <laughs> we, have, we have a few desert plants that actually survive on their own. But if you don't put a, a, a sprinkler system to a plant, it does not live where we live. Right. Right. And for the listeners, where is that? Uh, Las Vegas. Well, I appreciate you doing this. And. You know, I'll have told the listeners a little bit about what's going on by the time we get to here. You know, I'll record an intro. But you have a distinction, and I told you about this when we chatted before, that you were the first non-martial artist to come on the show. And it's because you are rather passionate, and that I think that's an understatement, about something that most martial artists, most athletes of any kind take for granted, and that's ice. Now, I know we're going to talk about the science. We're going to talk about why you're, this is so important to you. But we always start with any of our guests, we talk about background. So if you could just give us a little bit about your background and how you got from, you know, I guess I'll say the start of your, your professional career to where you're at now. Okay. Is that starting now or when you come on? I'm sorry. Uh, how, how, did you, how did you get to where you're at professionally? You know, I suppose college, you know, like what did you go to school for? And Let's go from there. Well, the, the, the story is, uh, is one of real life where my father was a concrete man. And every summer from 12 years old to all the way into my late teens, we worked on construction sites with my father. That's what we did. And um, I learned that I really didn't like that at all. And one day I was putting lime in the mixture to make the mortar and the lime blew up in my face, went up my nose and in my eyes. And I went, I'm not going to do this. I don't like this. So I told my father, I said, look, I can't do this. This isn't going to work for me. And one of his friends trying to help guide me said, well, what is it that you like? And I said, well, I like lifting weights. I like running, and I like hanging out with people that lift weights and run. And he said, well, Gary, that's not a job. And I said, yeah, it is. It's a gym. So I opened up a gym, and I attracted people to my gym that like lifting weights and run. And that's what I did the rest of my life. 
I never filled out a job application. I never did anything I didn't want to do as far as what people call work. Uh, I've never even had a thought about retiring. Uh, the last thing I want to do is stop doing what I do because it's what I like to do. So why would I want to stop? And uh, it's turned out to be very interesting because I'm at an age now where most of my peers, my, my friends are growing up, have retired. And they say to me, when are you going to retire? And I say, well, why? See, they all had jobs they didn't want to do. I never had a job I didn't want to do. The job I had, I never even considered work. And I do it because I enjoy helping other people accomplish their goals in the area of concern that I have for recovery and performance. And so there it is. That's how I got to where I am. And where did that, that passion for recovery come from? Most people that end up in the gym industry seem to focus on the, the stimulus portion. You know, they're, they're, if they're lifting weights, they focus on programming and supplements and the other things used in that kind of the, the front half of the equation. But you mentioned recovery, and, and that's the direction we're about to head. So where did the passion for that well, come from? What, what actually happened to me is that in 1973, I opened the seventh Nautilus gym in the world. And for anybody who goes back that far, they'll remember the old Nautilus equipment and the influence that Nautilus had on the, quote, fitness industry back in those days. And when I opened my center, people would come in and they'd want to work out. Uh, and they'd want to work out the way they had always worked out, you know, six, seven days a week, maybe split session, two, two workouts a day, five days a week. And I said, no, no, you work out twice a week. And it take you about 25 minutes, and that's all you do. And, and that was like, well, what? And the very essence of that two time per week, 25 minute or so workout was that you stimulated, you recovered, and then you grew. And you couldn't skip the recovery spot. You had to recover because you couldn't grow until you recovered. And so right from the very start, right in the very beginning, I had put in my into my process by the people who invented the Nautilus equipment that you've got to leave enough time between workouts so you can actually recover and grow. So I've always understood that you needed to do it. I didn't understand recovery like I do now back in 1973, but I certainly understood that you needed enough time between your stimulus periods for the muscles to recover and grow. So I don't think I did it on purpose. I think I did it because it was simply fact. And once I understood it, it was like, okay, well, what's the next question? You have to recover before you can grow. Right. right. And it's something that I think as people start to think about it, it, it makes a lot of sense. The idea that, you know, you can't hammer your body constantly and have it work. You can't, you know, redline a car constantly and not have the engine blow. It doesn't matter what we're talking about. That recovery, that that growth adaptation phase is, is critical. And it happens, you know, we're using the, you know, we're talking about weightlifting here in a sense, but it applies in martial arts just as well. I mean, whether you're, we're talking about strength or we're talking about speed or we're talking about accuracy with techniques or, or, or working your central nervous system to understand how to process certain movements, we need that recovery. Well, and what you can find out, and yes, of course, I, I agree 100% with what you just said. What happens to most people is they make a, a fundamental flaw in their judgment in that they'll say, once they buy into the fact of recovery, this is, okay, I believe you've got to recover. And what they'll do is they'll introduce a term that is very common in the, in the conversation of, of gym goers, and they'll call it overtraining. So they'll say, well, I'm, you know, I'm a little stale or I'm overtraining. Or, and I look at them and say, how do you know that? Uh, well, tell, me, tell me how you know that. And they'll be like, well, you know, because I, yeah, I, 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 I could do three sets of 10, and now I can only get one set of 10 and two sets of seven. So I know I'm actually getting weaker. So I know that I'm overtraining. And I say, well, you don't know that at all. Oh, no, no, no. I know I'm getting weaker. I mean, I know, I know my workout. And I say, no, no. Until we go over a fundamental question, tell me everything you're doing to facilitate recovery. 
That's a fair question, right? Tell me what you're Absolutely. doing to facilitate recovery. Be- because until you can demonstrate to me that you're overtrained, I need to know if, in fact, you're overtrained or under recovered. And if you look at me and can't give me any reasonable response to what you're doing to facilitate recovery, oh, well, you know, I, I drink a shake. I, I drink a recovery shake after I train. Okay, well, that's not enough, just so you know. That's, that's not really how it works. And what most people who claim to be overtrained, they're not overtrained at all. They're actually under recovered. And they haven't made an effort to facilitate recovery of any significant level. And as a result, they'll back off their training, thinking they're, in fact, overtrained, when in reality, they're simply under recovered. And with a little bit of effort, they'd be able to train even harder and get even better results than than they thought they were falling back from. They could go beyond where they where they were before, but they don't realize that that there's something you can do to recover. And if, if you go in the gym today, I don't think it would matter where you go, whether it be a uh, a martial arts studio or whether it would be a a gym or a CrossFit or whatever it might be. Almost everybody has quote recovery tools, and some of the recovery tools will be. Um, uh, um, rollers that you kind of roll on that go over your muscles and help them feel better. Foam rollers, they call them. And there's different names because they're not all foam anymore. And I'll look at them and I'll say, how do you figure that's recovery? And they say, oh, well, because it's, a, you know, it's, a rec- it's in the recovery area in the gym. And I said, well, it's not recovery though. And, and you have to think about it. You have to, you have to run process on yourself and say, well, what does that mean it's not recovery? Well, just look at the intent of a foam roller and what are you trying to do? You're trying to break an adhesion. You're trying to find a bad spot and roll it out and break the tissue to free it up. Well, that can't possibly be considered recovery. You're causing damage. The nature of the process is to cause damage. So how could that possibly be recovery? Right. And yet nearly everyone that I speak to considers that part of their recovery program. And in fact, it's not recovery at all. Or they'll go on something like uh, the Graston tools or the Hawk grip tools. They're, they're, I don't know whether you use them or not. Are you familiar with them? I am. I am, yeah. Okay, um, so... The, for, but we might have some folks so, listening who aren't. Well, so what they look like, they look like a butter knife, to tell you the truth. And uh, they take the, the, the blunt end of the butter knife and you kind of rub it across your muscles to help break up adhesions. And they'll call that part of recovery. That's not recovery. The intent is to cause tissue damage. How could that possibly be recovery? And so the point becomes, you've got to look and say, what am I doing to facilitate recovery? Well, to understand that, you'd have to know what recovery means. What does it mean? Well, it means that that which was damaged heals. Pretty simple. Recovered is just another word for nothing left to heal. So if you're fully recovered, you're healed. Pretty simple. So they'll say things like, well, you know, I, uh, I, I, I use ice. You know, I put ice on. And I said, well, how would that help? Well, you know, it, it, uh, it, it helps reduce swelling and, and uh, it helps the tissue mend. Okay, neither of those things are true, by the way. It doesn't reduce swelling. It actually increases swelling. And it doesn't facilitate healing of the tissue. It actually slows down the process. So when you know what I know, based on the reading of the literature, because a lot of people, by the way, just a little paragraph there or a little parenthesis, People often say, you know, what's your opinion? I don't have an opinion. I'm reporting facts to you. Mm. I'm not, I'm a reporter. I'm not a scientist. I simply went and read everything and organized the facts. And in fact, when you put ice on damaged tissue, you delay the healing process, you increase swelling, you cause additional damage, and you shut off the signals that alert your harmful movement, and you need movement to solve the problem, and you need those signals to alert you to harmful movement. So it doesn't help. It actually makes things worse. So that, that isn't part of recovery. We're going the wrong direction. And so you get to a spot where you say, well, help me understand recovery. Okay, great. Now we're in a good spot because we can start talking about what it means to recover. What it means to recover is tissue that was damaged is now fully recovered or healed. That's it. And so what makes that happen? Well, let's pick what stops it or slows it down. What slows it down is congestion. So say you've trained really hard or in, in the martial arts, 
uh, you took a, a nasty blow to your to your thigh. Uh, you know, a kick came through and it just caught you right in the middle of your quad, and it just aches. And there's a bruise beginning to form, you know, because the bruise is just broken capillaries where the blood is leaking out where it doesn't belong. So you you know it's damaged. You know the tissue is damaged. And you say, well, how does that translate back to recovery? Well, let's just let's, let's look at what happens. If you allow that congestion to just sit there, it will delay or inhibit the healing process. Because that congestion will beget congestion, which will begin to slow the process down of the movement of nourishment and supplies and waste to and from the area. So the good stuff in and the bad stuff out is basically blocked because of the congestion, the blood, and the, the, the dead cells from the muscles that were crushed. So you say, well, how do you get it out? Okay, that's a really important question because that is the essence of the whole point. How do you get it out? And you look at damaged tissue and you say, well, I've always heard you should do the RICE protocol, rest, ice, compression, elevation. Okay, well, it's completely wrong. And I realize that the first time you're hearing someone say that, you might go, wait a minute, what did he just say? What do you mean it's wrong? <laughs> it's wrong. It has nothing to do with managing and facilitating the healing of damaged tissue. Here's where it started. In 1962, a young boy by the name of Everett Knowles, 12 years old, hopped a freight train in Somerville, Massachusetts. Cheering for himself, he put his arm up and gave that, yay, I did it. And with that, hit a stone abutment and ripped his arm right off his body, tore it right off his torso. Fell to the ground, thinking he broke his arm, picked up his jacket with his arm in it. So there's this kid, doesn't have his arm attached anymore. He thinks he broke his arm. It's actually detached. So he makes his way up a hill. Some guys at a factory see him. They get him over to Mass General. And at Mass General, a young doc there named Ronald Malt makes a historic decision. Let's sew it back on. You understand in 62, that never happened before. They had never reattached a severed body part, so it hadn't been done. But Malt said, we got a fully intact arm with a perfectly healthy 12-year-old. Let's sew this thing back on. So in the meantime, while they were figuring out what they were going to do in the operating room and get the docs together who they would need to do this historic surgery, Malt gave an order, put that arm on ice. You know, while we're figuring this out, put the arm on ice to slow down the rotting of the tissue that's no longer connected to the body. And that was the beginning of the ice myth. That simple statement, put that arm on ice, now, it had to do with preserving a severed body part. It had nothing to do with putting on a bruise in your leg that someone just kicked you in, okay? But it translated to the public as, oh, if you get hurt, put ice on it. No, what Malt said was, if you have a severed body part, keep it out of the sun, put it on ice so it doesn't rot. So now they get done the surgery, and the kid comes out, and the, you know, he survives the surgery, and it makes worldwide news. Then when the young boy leaves the hospital, he waves, and that makes worldwide news. When I say worldwide, it was everywhere. It was on all of the shows, all the news shows. It was on Time Ma or Life magazine, Time magazine, and there was another one back there. I don't remember the name, but there was a third magazine. It made worldwide. Dr. Malt traveled the world teaching other doctors what they did to reattach the severed body part. Now, with that, the media, the news media, which was very limited back in those days, it's not like now. There was three or four outlets, and that was it, and you got the news each night at 6 o'clock. The reporters asked the question, when this happens, if this happens, what do we need to know? Now, watch carefully what happened. They said, remain calm. Don't panic. That became rest. Keep the severed body part out of the sun, out of the heat. Put it on ice if you have it. That became ice. Use a tourniquet to prevent a bleed out on the intact area. That became compression. And elevation was simply keep the intact part above the heart to limit blood flow. So the rice protocol has nothing whatsoever to do with getting kicked in the quad in a, in a karate match, in a martial arts match. Nothing to do with that. 
It has to do with preserving a severed body part and preventing a bleed out. That's all. It's completely misrepresented in the public. Now, that was in the early 60s. So if you know people from that era, and I do, and I've talked to them, I've interviewed dozens of people from that era. I was at that time about uh, 62, I would have been uh, nine years old then. So I don't remember myself, but I've interviewed people who were adults then, and even some doctors who were around that Mass General at the time. And what they will tell you is that when I grew up, for example, in the, in the late 50s, early 60s, when I grew up, we were told, walk it off. Don't sit still, it'll tighten up. Having no idea why that was so, everyone I grew up with knew that. No one ever told us to rest. No one ever told us to compress it. No one ever told us to put ice on it. And having the elevating it, we didn't know what that word meant. And then as the progressed in 62, when that surgery occurred, to 78, when the doctor, his name was uh, Gabe Merkin, an MD, Harvard-trained doc, uh, named what was happening in the public, and he named it RICE, Rest, Ice, Compression, Elevation. And with that, in his 1978 sports medicine book, Dr. Merkin immortalized that protocol. It was there. Today, you could go to basically anyone in the field, from a school nurse to an athletic trainer, to an MD, to a DC, to an ATC, to a PT, everyone knows, an ambulance driver, everybody knows the RICE protocol. The problem is it's wrong. And when I say it's wrong, there may be some listeners that say, what, hold on, how about if I could prove to you that the doctor who invented the RICE protocol has not only publicly recanted said, I made this up in my 1978 sports medicine book. Research has clearly shown I was wrong and gives a specific reference to the fact that it causes additional damage. If I could prove he has publicly recanted and wrote the forward to the anti-Iceman's book, which is me, would you at least listen? Because Google my name and you'll see his name on the front of my book. And with that, I get people's attention generally. Because they're like, well, I never heard this before. I'm, the reason I haven't heard it before is because the vast majority of people are still unaware of the fact that the RICE protocol had nothing to do with managing damaged tissue and certainly has nothing to do with facilitating the healing process, nothing to do with that. And what? when you come back and you find this out and you say, wait a minute, the doctor who made it up said he was wrong? And then he wrote the forward to the anti-ice man's book? Yes. So from from that point, I'll basically say next question. <laughs> so let me let me jump in here because we've we've just jumped into something big. I mean, this is this is big stuff. And as you said, everybody knows, quote unquote, knows the rice protocol. They know how important it is. They know that ice is critical to handling an injury. Martial artists get banged up. We get hurt. In fact, I doubt I could talk to anybody outside of maybe a, a light recreational Tai Chi program who has spent more than six to 12 months training who hasn't suffered some major, you know, contusion or, you know, twisting an ankle or, or you know, an elbows out of whack. And the first thing everybody talks about is ice. I was at a competition this weekend and I watched people putting ice on them. Now, I knew we were recording today, so I'm, I kind of delayed talking to them about it because, let's be honest, I'm not as good as art, at articulating this stuff as you are. This is, this is your passion. You have the knowledge. All I can really do is repeat things that you're saying because you've really, I mean, you're the one kind of leading this movement here. So I guess the question that anybody out there listening would say, now, wait a second, we're, we're pretty much talking about a conspiracy, maybe not an organized one, but it has that same effect. You can't be the only person who knows this. You you said that the the gentleman, the doctor who had coined that acronym has recanted. Why isn't this bigger news? Why aren't people shouting from the rooftops in this day and age of the internet when your information spreads in a matter of minutes that this is wrong? Well, I can tell you the reason and because I'm in the middle of it. Uh, what's going on is this. The ice business has become big business. 
And people sell ice machines that compress you while they ice you. They have machines that cost tens of thousands of dollars to blow cold air on you. Uh, they have machines that uh, that provide very tight wrappings around you. Uh, they have things that can measure how cold it is. There's all of this business. And uh, I would say I work with over 100 professional athletic teams and a couple hundred colleges and universities. And I can't think of a single training room that hasn't spent tens of thousands of dollars on icing products. And for 25 years, they've been icing people. So let me tell you a real story that just happened. I had a um, former head trainer from one of the major uh, leagues. So we're talking NFL, NBA, Major League Baseball, NHL. So it's a, a head trainer from one of those organizations. Been there for many, many years. And what he said was, uh, I don't believe what you're saying. And I said, well, what part don't you believe? Well, I don't believe it though, because I, I did it my whole career and I know, how, I know how effective it is. I said, well, did you ever not do it? Well, of course not. Well, then how would you know that what you were doing wasn't easy to perform better? How would you know that? Well, everybody ice Now, okay, that, that's a very weak argument. So let's just go and say, why would that trainer who spent decades in a national position believe that icing works. And why would he not be willing to admit today that it was wrong? Well, uh, one, imagine you were the person who was responsible for multi-million dollar athletes and you ice them. And I now have clinical proof right out of the medical literature, by the way, this isn't my opinion. I'm quoting and referencing the articles the research that's been done that's indexed peer-reviewed studies in their literature, okay? So it's not my stuff. It's not in, you know, Shape Magazine. We're talking about in the medical literature. Imagine that all these years you mismanaged all of those players and you caused people to have delayed recoveries and maybe inadequate recoveries. Maybe you even caused some players to never get better and not make it back to the game. You're going to admit that now? I mean, just think about the pressure on them in their own minds. Here they thought they did such a great job for all of these decades. But in fact, those people who didn't get better likely didn't get better because they were mismanaged. And it nearly always had to do with icing. And you say, well, can they, can't they just admit it that they were wrong? No. My experience is no. They can't admit it. And so say you were to go to a national conference that just happened a few weeks ago. And at a national conference, a group of people who uh, support the information that I've assembled and organized, or organized and presented, went up and spoke to the keynote speaker and said, so what do you think about this trend away from icing towards active recovery? And this famous doctor uh, I'm quoting now what they told me he said, so I'm assuming it's correct. He said, what trend? Now, since that was so easy to quote, I believe that's actually the quote that he said. When asked, doctor, what do you think about this trend away from icing towards active recovery? His response, what trend? Now, is there any chance that that doctor is that, is that ignorant? In other words, is that unaware of the fact? He doesn't know that icing delays healing, increases swelling, causes additional damage, and shuts off the signals to alert your harmful movement, and you need movement to solve the problem. Is there any chance he's unaware of all the facts? Not likely. Not someone at that level. But let's just say he doesn't want to know the facts. So he hears about an article, but he doesn't actually read it. Now, why would he not want to present that information to his audience. You know, he's a keynote speaker. I mean, all the top sports medicine docs in the country are at the meeting. Why, you know, all the ones who attended, I'm not, I'm not every single person comes, but you know what I mean. The audience is full of all these experts who all ice. There's always a, that, a, you know, a risk in, in doing that, in, in, you know, 
deviating well, from the norm. If you're the keynote speaker, you're going to tell the whole audience what they're doing is wrong. Yeah. Not, not likely. I wouldn't. I stand, I stand up and do it all the time, but I'm not the keynote speaker at that big meeting. Right. And then in the audience, you have all of the people who have been doing it for all of these years. They clearly are not going to admit to what they're doing is wrong. I'm, I'm there. I know. I know what they won't do. So you have this problem where the reason you haven't heard about it mainstream is simply and basically because they don't want you to know. They're not going to admit what they're doing is wrong. They've been doing it so long and to so many people that to admit it now would mean that they're in trouble with their, with their, with their process. And I'll give you what the trouble would be. And I've been advised to not make this comment. Uh, and I think this will be the first time I ever did it on air. I have been contacted by more than several sports agents. Okay. Now follow me because this is really important. Sure. And the sports agents have said to me, Gary, we've heard what you're saying. In fact, most had listened to at least a podcast or two that I had been on or read an article about me in, the, in some magazine or something. And they say, can you prove what you're, what you're saying? I said, I don't need to prove it. It's already been proven. And here are the references and, you know, give me your email and I'll send them to you right now. And here they are. And they said, well, would you be willing to be a professional witness? I'm like, why would you want me as a professional witness? Get one of the doctors who publicly acknowledged it. You know, here's a list of a dozen doctors, orthopedic surgeons who no longer tell their patients to ice. So why would you want me? I mean, I'll do it for you, but why would you want me? Why would you want to get an orthopedic surgeon to tell you why you shouldn't do it? And then, of course, you start to realize what's going on. And what's going on is this. The agents are saying, say you were an agent for a player, okay? Mm -hmm. And that player was promised a $5 million performance bonus if they did A, B, and C, right? But they got hurt halfway through the season. And the trainers consistently iced that player, Iced them in the morning, iced them at lunch, iced them before dinner, tell them to ice at home. And the player doesn't get better and doesn't receive his performance bonus. Five million dollars is a lot of money. Sure. That will get your attention. But if you're the agent who gets 15% of that, you're talking about seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Do you think anybody's ever going to bring this up in court? That your mismanagement of my athlete, of my client, caused them to not earn their performance bonus. We want the money. Now, people say to me, Gary, you, that's, you're stretching. Well, hold on. Hold on. How long ago was it you would have said I was stretching it about concussion management? And how long ago would you have said I was stretching about the abuse of opioids in, in sports? Because only a few years ago, those two things changed. Right. I'm telling you right now, it's, it's coming. I'm, I see it. I see the bright light coming down the track through the tunnel and it's coming full speed. And people are starting to realize it. Well, wait a minute. You mean if, 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 if I don't ice someone, that's more defensible than if I do ice them? Because a lot of people say, well, you know, I'm just doing what everybody does. No, that's not the way evidence medicine works. Evidence, evidence-based medicine works like this. If there's evidence to support what you're doing, that's your defense. If there is evidence that says what you're doing is wrong, that's not your defense. That's what the other side uses against you. Well, the literature is clear. Icing damaged tissue, delays healing, increases swelling, causes additional damage, and shuts off the signals, alerts your harmful movement, and you need movement to solve the problem. This is very simple stuff. It's very clear in the literature. There have been four worldwide reviews done since 2004. 2013, the British Journal of Sports Medicine, 2008, the Journal of Emergency Medicine, 2004, the Journal of Athletic Medicine Research, and 2004, the American Journal of Sports Medicine. I believe that last one I might have wrong, but it's something like that. Four worldwide reviews, okay? Mm -hmm. Conclusion. I'm summarizing, but conclusion. Although popular, there is no evidence whatsoever this helps. And I add to that, and there is undeniable proof 
that it causes additional damage, that it delays the healing process, and that it increases swelling. Mm-hmm. Undeniable proof. And you say, what? But everybody does it. Well, hold on. No, they don't. Listen to some of the interviews I've done. I now have uh, players from all 30 Major League Baseball teams, over 200 Major League pitchers confirmed using our recommended muscle activation technique, which is called Mark Pro. It's a, it's a device that's available for sale. But that's not the point of this. It's an active recovery technique, but I just happen to recommend the Mark Pro, and that's what the players are using. So I have over 200 Major League pitchers using Mark Pro. And many, if not most, use none or very little ice. And in fact, one of the most famous pitchers last year, Corey Kluber, if you listen to the interview I did with him, just put in Corey Kluber, Mark Pro, and they'll pop right up for you. And you'll see Corey say, I don't like my arm. It makes it feel, makes it feel junky. I don't like it. I use this and my arm feels the best to fuck my whole career. And he doesn't use ice. And I can name you a couple dozen other major league pitchers that don't use ice. And yet, if you asked or if you looked around, you think they all use ice. Well, no, they don't. No, they don't. And in major universities, I have a, at a minimum of several dozen. I'm certain there's more than that, but I'll just, for this purpose, I'll say several dozen universities in the country, colleges and universities, where the pitching staff does no ice. And yet in baseball, all the pitchers use ice, right? No, that's not true anymore. Now, seven years ago, when I started working with pitchers, basically, mostly all of them used ice. And then I start asking them questions. Why are you doing it? And they say, well, the, it helps with healing. And I say, well, how would that work? Well, what do you mean? Well, it helps with healing. How would that work? How does it help? Oh, well, it flushes blood in or something. Like, well, no, it actually doesn't do that. It actually stops the blood flow. So that's not, that's not what it would do. Uh, and why would you think you would need to do that anyway? You think that your immune system doesn't know how to manage that damaged tissue? Now, you got to think about this because this, this isn't, this isn't a, you know, theory I'm saying right now. This is, like, this is like just plain, straight thinking. Do you actually believe that your innate intelligence, your immune system, doesn't know how to properly manage damaged tissue? I mean, you got to think about this. You think it does it wrong. And if you think it does it wrong, you think it does it wrong every time for every person? I mean, do you really believe that? You think there's any chance that every time someone gets hurt, their immune system mismanages the recovery process, the healing process? That doesn't even make up. sense, does no. it? No. That doesn't. It doesn't well, I'll prove it to you that it doesn't work, by the way. That's not true. Have you ever looked in the mirror on the back of your arm or the back of your shoulder or something, seen a bruise, and it's mm-hmm. no longer purple? It's kind of like yellowish, greenish. So you know it's been there for a while. You've seen that, yeah. right? It's happened to you, right? And, and I'll bet all of your listeners can say, yeah, yeah, I know that happened to me one time. Well, let me ask you a question. H- how did that happen? And you go, I don't, I don't really remember when it happened. And so how long did it happen? Well, I don't really know how long ago it happened. And, and so what it's been doing to, to, to cause that tissue to heal and to cause the evacuation of that waste? What have you specifically been doing? Remember, you didn't even know it was there. You didn't even know it happened. So you haven't done anything. And yet your immune system's handling it just perfectly fine, isn't it? So when you don't know about it, your immune system does a perfect job of, of sealing off the broken vessels, growing a clot, repairing the vessel, dissolving the clot, normalizing flow in some three to 10 days or so, dilating the healthy surrounding vessels, increasing perfusion to the area, in other words, bringing in the repair and cleanup crew, and packaging the waste for evacuation along your lymphatics. It did that all by itself. But when you roll your ankle or you get kicked in the quad, suddenly your immune system doesn't know how to do it. Now, that is utterly absurd to think that it doesn't know how to do it or mismanages it. And there are people that will say, uh, if, you, if you hear the, you know, the ones who like this point out that I'm wrong, uh, which you know I've never had anybody point out I was wrong in state of fact, by the way. So if you pull me up on the internet, You'll see that there are people who say I'm stupid, I'm unqualified, I don't know what I'm talking about. You'll see all that, but you'll never see them point out something that I just said that wasn't clinical fact. The human body, when you're damaged, repairs itself, and it works like this. The human body is designed to self-repair, not self-destruct. If it's self-destructing, figure out why and make the appropriate change. It's that simple. 
If we didn't know how to self-repair, if your immune system didn't know how to fix the problem, honestly, we, we would still be here. Now, you got to think about that because if it didn't know how to self-repair, we would have died off long ago. It knows how to self-repair. And it self-repairs not by trapping the waste in and around the damaged site and preventing circulation, which is what icing and compression do. Now, do a simple test to yourself, okay? Uh, I know we're on over the air and it's not in, in person, but everybody listening, just, just do this. I promise it's simple. Take your hand and go around your opposite wrist and squeeze it, like compress it, okay? Now, while I'm doing that, and, and I'd like you to answer this question for me, okay? Sure. So you're squeezing, right? You're doing mm -hmm. it? Mm-hmm. Are you compressing only the in or the in and out vessels? It's really important. Tell me what you think you're doing. Are you That's... compressing only the in or the in and out? Well, uh, it's, I mean, it's got to be in and out because I can't imagine that okay. they're okay. grouped in so any kind you're... of way that I could miss them. Of course. So you're 100% correct, and nobody's ever disagreed with that. Uh, there's a thousand people that question, all thousand have said, well, yeah, you couldn't just do the in. You, you got to get both. Okay, so let's think about compression. They tell you they're going to do compression. You roll your ankle or whatever, and they tell you to wrap it, you know, limit the swelling. And you say, well, okay, you're going to limit the swelling. Okay, let me just ask you a question. Um, are you sure there's too much? In other words, is there too much fluid coming to the site? Are you sure? I don't oh, know. yeah, yeah, you don't want too much coming there. Well, okay, but, but you're wrapping it before you know how much is coming. So do you have a way of gauging how much is coming to know that, in fact, it's going to be too much? Is it 5% too much, 71% too much, 42% too much? Or right feet different than left feet or hands different than, than my hands different than your hands? You see the little problem? I do. How in the world could you restrict something if you don't know, in fact, if it's too much or not? Maybe it's not even enough. You don't even know. But you have no way of measuring how much is there. So you don't really know if there's too much or too little or just enough. And you don't know whether it's 5% or 80% or 3% or oh, I'm different than you or feet are different hands. You don't know any of that. So imagine if I came to you and I said, look, I want you to do something, but I have no idea what you should do. But I just want you to do it because we think it's a good idea. What would you tell me? I mean, what, you'd look at me like I was the dumbest person talking to you, right? I'd be like, why would I do something like that? Okay, well, that's what compression does. You have no idea what you're compressing to. So let's just say you were right and you should compress it. And somehow you figure out how much to compress, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, you compress the area. Remember, you're squeezing around the top of your wrist there, and you're, you're shutting it down so that the, bad, the, the, the good stuff can't get in, right? So you're stopping it. You're, you're really slowing it down so it doesn't swell, even though your immune system has sent that fluid to the area by dilating the healthy surrounding vessels and increasing perfusion. So the fluid coming to the area is sent there on purpose by your immune system. It's not some arbitrary or archaic event. It is a well-orchestrated process where the fluid is being sent to the damaged site to mobilize, repair, and clean up crew and package the waste for evacuation. But you're smarter than your immune system, so you're gonna, you're gonna compress it. Okay, now let's go back to this. Reverse the question. You're compressing it. You've acknowledged that, in fact, you're compressing the in and out vessels. So let me make sure I understand exactly what you say you're going to do, okay? Carefully, everybody, listen. You're telling me you're going to deliberately trap the waste in and around the damaged site. That's what you just told me you're going to do. You're going to deliberately prevent the waste from evacuating the damaged site. Does that sound a good idea to you? No. Sounds terrible. Why would anyone do that? And by the way, again, I've asked thousands of people that question. Not a single person's ever said, well, yeah, you want to trap the waste in and around the damaged site. Nobody's ever said that. And yet they all wrap them. They wrap them. I was just at the National Athletic Trainers Association meeting in New Orleans last week. I had several hundred athletic trainers come by to see me to hear what I'm telling you right now. And basically every one of them when I got done, I went, this is crazy. We're, we're all doing it wrong. Now, they all said it different ways, but mostly that was the point they said. We're all doing it wrong. And I said, no, you're not all doing it wrong. I can name a couple hundred that are doing it right. And now if you don't do it wrong anymore, you'll add to the pile of people doing it right. 
And what I point out to these trainers is a very simple point. The difference between the middle of the heap and the top of the heap are results. If you're in the middle of the heap, in other words, you're a trainer in a university and you're trying to work your way into the top of the pros. So the top of the heap is the pros and the middle of the heap is the people at the uh, collegiate level. Now, that doesn't mean if you're at a high school level, you aren't in the middle of the heap. I'm not, that's not the point. The point is that there's the middle. What's the difference between the middle and the top? Well, their education is identical. Their credentials are identical. They have the exact same letters after the name. It's the same test. The difference is results. And whoever gets the best results gets to the top of the heap. And I look at people and I ask them, now let me ask you, and I tell them, if I may ask you a simple question, do you believe if you continue to do what you used to do, what you just told me you used to do, you'll be closer to the top of the heap or closer to the middle if you stop doing it and do what I just told you? Every single person acknowledges, well, if I stop doing it, I'll get closer to the top of the heap. Of course you will. What you're doing is wrong. Resting doesn't work. There's not a chance in the world that rest works. There is not a chance in the world that putting ice on works. There's not a chance in the world that compressing the area works. It has to do with preserving a separate body part, preventing a bleed out when you amputate a body part. So it is. It has nothing to do with managing damaged tissue. When you manage damaged tissue, what you want to do, it's very simple, it's not complicated. What you want to do is decongest the area. You don't want to prevent the fluid from getting to the site. That's wrong. That's a misguided thought. Because you don't, firstly, you wouldn't know how much to prevent. So how would you do it? But that fluid is being sent there deliberately. And you have to assume your immune system is doing it right. Remember, that immune system is the same system that puts eyelashes where they belong and fingernails where they belong. So right before you think you're smarter than your innate intelligence, just think about where you'd put a fingernail and where you'd put an eyelash because your immune system puts it right where it belongs. So high probability that otherwise healthy people, their immune system is responding in the best possible way to damaged tissue. So you've got this damaged tissue and you know, you're kicked in the quad in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a martial arts event and it really starts to hurt and it starts to swell and, and, and the blood's bruising all, you know, you can see the bruise and the blood's leaking and it's starting to get more swollen, it's more tight and hurting more. Okay, now let's just think about it for a second. Here's the solution. Stay still, put ice on it, and tightly wrap the area. Now, how in the world could that possibly solve the problem? And yet, that's what nearly everyone will do, unless you understand. If you understand, you'd say, okay, I've got damaged tissue. I've got congestion forming. I rely on my immune system to stop the bleeding and to repair this damaged site. So what is the only obstacle that I can manage right now? What can I do? Well, what you can do is decongest the area. And then the only reasonable question from my perspective would be, how do you decongest the area? I mean, how's that work? Well, the particles are too big to go back through your venules, back through your veins, so they got to go back to what's called your lymphatic system. You've got some 165,000 miles or more, maybe 300,000 in big people, but whatever. There's a bunch of miles of lymphatic vessels in your body, and they're basically passive. And they move waste through the system by activating the muscles around the vessels. I, I look at it, it looks like you're milking a cow backwards. So every time the muscles squeeze around the vessels, they push the waste up a chamber. That empty chamber has a negative pressure that pulls more waste in out of the interstitial space. So the waste is evacuated. And that's the way your lymphatics works. If you want to visualize it, it's a lot like a garbage disposal system. And if you look at your sink, it's kind of backed up and you haven't pushed that button on the wall that you see some vegetables floating to the top and dirty water starts to accumulate. But you push the button, boom, and off it goes. It's all gone. Well, that's how your lymphatic system works. So you look at it and you say, well, why don't I activate the muscles around my lymphatic vessels and move that waste out of there so the area is not decongested so my immune system, my innate intelligence can repair the tissue? Well, that's what you do. If you do that, otherwise healthy people will heal in a fraction of the time. I have an article out called Procrastination, 
a fundamental flaw in injury management. It's free. Just put my name in, put procrastination in my name, Rhino, R-E-I-N-L. It'll pop up. It's totally free. There's nothing for sale. Just go and get it. Read it. In the article, I explain to you what happens if you let it sit. We have cut the rate of recovery in half in hundreds of cases across the country. And I'll tell you on the air what we didn't put in print. It's not hundreds, it's thousands. It's thousands. And we haven't cut it in half. It's even more than that. But my co-author asked me, why don't we just stay with half? Because why, why make any bigger claim? That's plenty of a claim. I can tell you right now, it's faster than half the time. And what we do is we decongest the area by activating the muscles around the vessels. Exactly the same thing as I was told in the late 50s and 60s, walk it off. Because all walking it off did was cause the muscles around the lymphatic vessels to milk that cow backwards, pushing that button on the garbage disposal so that waste evacuated. You evacuate the waste, the tissue heals. You leave the waste sitting in around the, the damaged site, and you will suffocate and kill otherwise perfectly healthy cells in the area that were not involved in the initial trauma. They will suffocate and die. You will get faulty scarring from the lack of movement, we're called adhesions, and you will have subsequent tissue atrophy from the lack of motion. If you simply and basically decongest the site right up front, don't let it sit there, don't let it accumulate, don't try to block it for heaven's sakes because it's bringing in the repair and cleanup crew. It's going to package the waste for evacuations. So don't try to seal it off with a bandage. And remember, if you seal it off, you're trapping the waste in and around the damaged site. So here you are thinking you're preventing the stuff from getting there, which you shouldn't have done in the first place. But in fact, besides not letting the good stuff get in, you're stopping the bad stuff from getting out. So clearly that's not the right path. You simply decongest the area and the immune system will step over and the human body will self-repair. Wow. Now, of course, we're going to link to your book and this article you mentioned and the other things that we've spoken about today. I think at this point, anyone listening either has their fingers in their ears, which would make for a terrible listening experience to a podcast, or they're accepting what you're saying, or at the, at the very least, they're willing to learn more. So we're going we're gonna to help them get in that direction. I want to switch gears a little bit now and talk about what people should be doing instead. And I'd like to look at it from the perspective of, yes, the individual, but more so, I'm sure we have a lot of martial arts school owners and instructors, trainers effectively out there who are going to want to implement something different after hearing your words, but aren't quite sure what they should be telling people. So maybe you can speak to, to what each of those groups might want to consider for moving forward. Sure. Uh, the, the great news is it's ancient wisdom. It's walk it off. Keep moving. Stillness is the enemy. Don't sit still. You've got to move that waste through your system. You've got to mobilize repair and cleanup crew. So you can use a device like we use, the Mark Pro, and it works wonderfully. And it lets, lets you work whatever area you need to work. Uh, you can simply move your muscles by uh, activating. Like if you, if you know anything, if you have any experience in a, in a physical therapy or an athletic training setting, they'll tell you to do ankle pumps. And they'll tell you to kind of move your foot back and forth and kind of flex your calf muscle and muscles in your foot. And that'll help move the waist along out of your lower body. It works perfectly fine. If it's your hand or your forearm or your elbow area, you can squeeze a, a light ball. And you activate the muscles. That's all it takes. The human body is designed to self-repair and self-destruct. It's that simple. And it does that via muscle activation. So you activate the muscles. You move the waist along. You, bring in the, you, you clear the path for the nourishment and the supplies to come in and fix the problem. And you will self-repair. Now, that's in otherwise healthy people. We're not talking about the extremes that are dying in a hospital or a hospice, okay? We're talking about the otherwise healthy people. They will self-repair. Now, does it help to have a good diet? Sure. Does it help to be adequately hydrated and rested? Of course, yes. Yes, I'm expecting that you are adequately hydrated, nourished, and rested. Can you eat some foods that are better than others to facilitate healing? Of course. And information is all available in the internet or in books, whatever. Uh, I mean, who doesn't know that, that eating a piece of, uh, uh, of broccoli is better than eating a broccoli-flavored potato chip? I mean, come on. Of course it is. 
So just use your head and eat good food. Drink things that are nourishing. Uh, water is a great product, by the way. It's a wonderful product. Uh, there are other things that you can use to, to help rehydrate the body if, in fact, you are dehydrated. Uh, one of the things, I don't want to say a brand name, but I say this because so many people are drawn to a, a false product. Uh, in other words, a product that is very popular but does very little to rehydrate your body. I won't say that name, but there is a product <laughs> called The Right Stuff, and The Right Stuff really is The Right Stuff. So if you don't want to use the right stuff, that's perfectly fine. I can tell you basically all of my customers do. So the 100 plus pro teams that I work with, they all use it. Now, that said, just Google the right stuff, see what they got, and go find something else like that if you don't want to use theirs. But, but in the process, read why the popular stuff isn't good for you. And the popular stuff is more of a social drink. And if you want a social drink, that's fine, but just realize it's not going to help rehydrate you. So get a good rehydration product, drink water, eat good clean food, and, uh, and get adequate rest, and then decongest the area. The decongest the area, that is the key. If you get the congestion out, the subsequent downstream problems don't happen. And here they are. The downstream problems are you suffocate and kill otherwise perfectly healthy cells. So you get the waste out, and that doesn't happen. If you leave the way sit there, you won't have as good a movement and reorganization of repaired tissue, so you'll get faulty scarring or what are called adhesions. And anybody who's ever had the pleasure of someone breaking your adhesions post-trauma, so you hurt yourself, and now you got to go back to therapy to get your arm to move again because you have adhesions that are preventing it from moving. Uh, everybody, please, just trust me. It's better not to get the adhesion. So it is unpleasant. The waste out. Absolutely. There's, there, there's just no point to it. It's like, why do you let that happen? Well, get the congestion out. Re there's three things that happen in healing. This, we didn't say this, so I'll throw it now. Uh, there's three things. There's inflammation, repair, and remodel. These are the three steps to healing. They're not my three steps. Google, you'll see that everybody agrees, basically. Uh, some places call it uh, 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 proliferation and maturation instead of repair and remodel. Who cares? Same thing. It's inflammation, repair, remodel. If you went to the fancy school, you might say proliferation and maturation, whatever. It's repair and remodel. So if you keep the area decongested, then what you have is the opportunity for the tissue to not mend in a faulty way. And you don't get those adhesions. So you don't have that issue downstream to break the adhesions and basically slow down your rehab process. And then beyond the, uh, the process of, of getting the tissue to remodel and not have the adhesions, well, the next thing is preventing the disuse atrophy because the disuse atrophy is the result of not using. That's why it's called disuse atrophy. So if you use it, you don't lose it. So you get hurt or you have a surgery and you expect that you're going to have the muscles shrink. You expect that you're going to have adhesions, faulty scarring, and you expect that you're going to suffocate and kill otherwise perfectly healthy cells because of the congestion. We'll get rid of the congestion and the downstream stuff doesn't happen. It's like, well, what? that sounds pretty simple. Right, that's, why we're, that's how we're cutting recovery time in half across our system. And our system, by the way, isn't something we invented. Our system is just saying, what's supposed to happen? Well, what's supposed to happen is the tissue will stop bleeding. So it's called hemostasis and it stops bleeding. And then the inflammatory response sets in nearly immediately because the, the, the bleeding is stopped in within minutes. And then the inflammatory process comes in, which sets in motion the cleanup and repair crew. And then you have the repair phase and then the remodeling phase. So these three steps are going to happen. And the only thing that really gets in their way, again, assuming you have adequate hydration, uh, nourishment, and rest. So I'm assuming those three things are in place. The only thing that gets in the way is the congestion. So decongest the area. How do you do it? Activate the muscles in and around the damaged site, and the congestion will evacuate by your lymphatics. That's it. It's that simple. And you say, well, what? Okay, that's it. <laughs> that's all you have to do. <laughs> Just decongest the area in and around the damaged site. Go back to the 50s, the 60s, the 40s, the 20s, 300 years ago. Everybody walked it off. 
This myth got started in the early 60s. By the late 70s, the myth was in place. Stay still, rest. Put ice on it, don't let it move. Compress it, stop stop from getting around. Come on, it's wrong. Stop it. It's the wrong answer. The right answer is what they did for all time, and that was walked it off. I mean, just imagine the, 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 the group, the tribe, whatever the name would be given to the people at the time, and they're walking across, and you know, the, the dad or the leader of the, of the tribe is trying to get the group to the next safe place for the night. Okay? And they're trying to find some food along the way. And Billy stubs his toe. Do you think the whole tribe stopped while Billy whined for two hours? <laughs> no, they said, keep walking, it'll go away. Walk it off. Now, I know that's like, I'm making it so simplistic. But the fact is, when I grew up in the 60s, Every coach told us to walk it off. They said, don't sit still, it'll tighten up. And anyone old enough to remember that knows that's what everybody told us. And it always worked. And I never thought about why it worked. We just knew it worked. And for all history, until that small gap from 62 to 78, when the myth started to grab hold and the illusionary treatment option stepped in, which is the name of my book, by the way, it's called Ice, the Illusionary Treatment Option. It's because it's not a real option. It's wrong. Go back to what we always did. We walked it off. Move it. If you activate the muscles in and around the damaged site, the waste will evacuate, the nourishment will come in. So the repair and cleanup crew will come to the site and the waste will evacuate. The great creator built the body in such a spectacular way that the same stress that brings in the good takes out the bad. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, just imagine what a great design. Clearly, you have to win one of those uh, Nobel Prizes if you figured that one out, wouldn't you? I mean, you just have to get it. Yeah. Well, why? Because if there were two different stresses, if one stress brought in the good and a different stress took out the bad, think how dysfunctional the process could become quickly. But in this case, it's designed where... The same thing that brings the good stuff in, simultaneously takes the bad stuff out. Well, how's that work? Well, the good stuff comes in because of the stress, so the muscles are calling for additional supplies to the area. So that stress brings the supplies in, and then simultaneously, a different system, your lymphatic system, is taking the waste out. So the good stuff comes in, the bad stuff comes out, both relying on the exact same muscle activation, so the same stress brings in the good and takes out the bad. And if anyone is out there and they're saying, this sounds too simple. Okay, it is too simple. If it were complicated, again, we wouldn't still be here. It had to be simple. If it wasn't simple, we would not have survived as a species. It had to be good stuff in, bad stuff out, same stress. That stress had to be muscle activation. And if you think about it, by the way, kind of an interesting way uh, in, in my mind to think about it is what's the one thing that the great creator would have, could have counted on? In other words, you got these people you're going to put on earth, however we got here, whatever. You believe whatever you want to believe. But here we are. We're here. Now, there is no chance that the great creator can come down and manage every single person's bump and bruise, right? That's just, that's impractical. Right. I know, I know. There are some people who say, yes, you could. Okay, whatever. But the reality is it would be very difficult to manage every single bump and bruise that everybody got. Unless you pick the way to fix it that everyone would have to do. And that was activate their muscles. So we self-repair via muscle activation. So what could you count on people doing on earth? You could count on them walking, hunting, hunting, gathering, right? You could count on that. So picking things up, moving, walking around, going to the next place for shelter, doing things. You could count on people doing stuff. So when we were made, when we were invented, the mechanism to heal thyself was put in the body, in the muscle. When the muscles activated, the muscle drives the healing process. And if you want to read that, by the way, if anybody says, well, I don't know about that. Well, I do know. Okay. So I do know. And you can look up the word myokine, 
M-Y-O-K-I-N-E-S, myokines. And you can read all about it, and you'll see that, in fact, the muscles drive the tissue regeneration preservation process. It's elegant. It's a, it's a really elegant solution and one that if we were to design on our own, I think we would be thrilled to get there. Would probably require I, I, some... can't, I can't imagine it any other way. And right. I do imagine very often about, well, how else could you have done this? I, I can't imagine any other way. So you can't say, well, here's a better way. No, there isn't a better way. Simply moving facilitates the process of preserving and regenerating tissue. If you don't move, the tissue shrinks and rots. If you do move, and by the way, who hasn't heard use it or lose it? Right. Do you think that was just like that, a passing comment? No, we know that if you sit still, if you don't do anything, the tissue will shrink or what's called atrophy. We also know that if you do things, it will hypertrophy or grow. So here we've got this process in place for the human body to self-repair, not self-destruct. And for some unknown reason to most people, I've explained to you the reason, the idea of sitting still with a bag of ice wrapped tightly around the damaged site caught on. It's, it's unexplainable. You couldn't make this up. Nobody would believe you. If you said, I have a great new way to manage damaged tissue, I want you to sit still, we're going to make it really cold, and wrap this bandage around it real tight. If I walked in and said that to you, and, and you knew that was wrong, you'd look at me like, that's the dumbest idea I ever heard. And in fact, I'm hoping that right now, you have enough information that when I say that to you, you say, well, that's a dumb idea, that wouldn't work. I'm hopeful that everyone who's listening got it, that you don't facilitate the healing of damaged tissue or the preservation of tissue around damaged tissue by sitting still, by making it cold, and putting a tight wrap around it. Remember, if you put the tight wrap around it, what'd you do? You prevent it, the waste from evacuating the damaged site. Now, yes, it's true you prevent it to repair and clean up from getting to the site, but let's let that go. Let, let, let that go and just remember that if you wrap it tight, you are trapping the waste in and around the damaged site. That's utterly foolish. No one, no one would recommend that. Making it cold delays healing, increases swelling, causes additional damage, and shuts off the signals that alert you to harmful movement. And you need movement to solve the problem, and you need those signals to alert you to harmful movement. So this is very simple. You know it's wrong to do it any other way than I've just described. And now that you hear it, if someone were to say to you, hey, you know, that's a nasty kick you got in your quad there. Man, it's really starting to swell up. Wow, it's really black and blue. Or say a guy tore a hamstring doing something and the blood's starting to show in the back of their leg. Would you today, knowing what you know right now, would you today walk up to them and say, look, here's what you need to do. You need to stay still, put a bag of ice on it, and wrap it real tight. Seriously, would you tell anyone to do that right now, knowing what you now know? Okay, hopefully your audience knows that too. And join the, the, the tens of thousands of people uh, who are now aware, and there are that many, by the way, over a million people have heard this message from me. So there are tens of thousands who are now following this simple, basic reality information, and we're shifting it. And what I say is join the meltdown. There really isn't any more to say, is there? Mr. Rhino presented this information in a way that you can't argue. I'm sure there may be, well, I guess I can't say I'm sure. I'm suspecting there are some of you out there who are having a hard time swallowing this. Well, head on over to the show notes. We've got some links. There's other information. This guy's got a great book. You know, there's, there's a lot of stuff that you can research. And this is a perfect example of why we need to keep an open mind. Something that we all thought we knew actually proved to be completely false. You can find the show notes, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, our website, whistlekick.com. Find us on social media, at whistlekick. And don't be afraid to email me, jeremy, at whistlekick.com. That's all I've got for you today. We'll be back with another episode in just a few days. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. 